Hi everyone and, and thanks so much for, for joining us. Welcome to our Jossie Talks webinar number three. Um, hopefully by now the ones that have been on a few before know who I am. Um, I'm Savannah I'm Joss and I'm the founder of Joss Search and if you're new to us and this is your first one, welcome. We're a boutique recruitment consultancy in London and New York and we're super passionate about championing hidden heroes, so sort of support staff behind the scenes. Uh, we launched these weekly events just to sort of help us through all these uncertain and scary times and it's about us doing a little bit for, for the hidden heroes, our clients and candidates to help them be better, better equipped to cope. Last week we, we looked at mental health and well-being whilst we're on lockdown and we did have some really great feedback so we're really glad it inspired and helped some people at this time. Um, following your feedback we always send out a survey and we decided it would be really useful for everyone to have the perspective from a senior leader of some of the challenges that they faced in this situation um, and, and so, so that everyone can learn from each other, really. We're all struggling at this time, and bosses in particular have had to make, some, some bosses have had to make some really tough decisions um, with limited information and, and not actually being able to do it in the way that they normally would face-to-face. -face. Sometimes we, we, you know, we're stuck in our houses and we're trying to lead and inspire people, which does present a lot of personal and, and professional challenges. But today we've got Paul, um, who is happy to join us, and Paul is, um, uh, someone who has led team remote led teams remotely for some time so he's a couple of steps ahead of us um, and has some learnings and some tips for us to share including how to communicate better um, and how to use tech to lead teams remotely he's the president of a marketing consultancy and agency and you can find him on Twitter you're quite active on there aren't you Paul Paul underscore Hello. Tramp and he's also on LinkedIn as well um, and to make this really relevant to your challenges uh, so not only understanding a leader's perspective, but also how to support them virtually in these times. We're really lucky that Eloise, hi Eloise, who's Paul's VA for some time now, a mega hidden hero, um, she's here with us too to give us her angle of how she's been able to be proactive and support Paul professionally and personally, as well as looking after two other CEOs, is that right? Um, despite, I think you're, am I right in saying you guys have never met face to face, is that right? That's right, that's correct. Yeah, so um, I think it's a Really great opportunity to, 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 to see how they've made it work um, and, and made it work really, really well. So um, obviously, given that I'm the CEO of Joss Search, I've also had some challenges and I've got two small children at home like Paul. You've also got two. I just met sort of Jack. Um, luckily, mine are out, so they won't be making an appearance. Um, but hopefully, I'll also be able to add a little bit of value. And it's going to be a lot more conversational today than the, the previous two. We're going to be discussing the following challenges of working remotely, so leading and motivating teams effective communication, uh, juggling professional and personal responsibilities such as childcare, um, and how a top VA helps, can help you manage um, so we can all be the best version of ourselves. We're going to regularly open up the floor to Q&A, so please um, use the Q&A section um, on the, the bottom of the, of the screen. Um, you can use the anonymous, if you tick anonymous, then we can keep those questions private, but please send them and we'll get, get through as many as possible throughout the conversation and we'll have plenty of time at the end to do some more. Um, so I really hope you guys found today's live conversation helpful and that we all go away with some tips to better lead our teams and to support our better at this time. So Paul, why don't you go first and give us a quick intro into who you are and what your background and why you agreed to do this. And then um, we can do the same with Eloise and then we'll get cracking into the questions we've got lined up. Thank you, Savan. Thank you for a great introduction and uh, delighted to be here. Uh, so I'm Paul Frampton Calera, as Savan said. Uh, I spent about 20 years working in a big corporate um, advertising and marketing company, a French uh, group, uh, and was used to working uh, in an office the whole of those 20 years. Then joined a startup that I scaled across Europe for a couple of years uh, and worked in a, in a half remote uh, model and half office model because my uh, my HQ was in Hong Kong so I spent I became familiar with Zoom for the first time which wasn't a, a tool I'd used and using other messaging platforms and then about six months ago uh, I joined a US marketing uh, consultancy and agency which I've launched in Europe uh, which is entirely virtual 100% uh, remote uh, so I've had to acclimatize and change my leadership style and how we manage the business and inspire and engage people and get stuff done working entirely remotely. So I'm a big advocate for it. It took a while to get used to it, to be honest. Uh, and I appreciate that a lot of you have been thrust into it without any warning and therefore it's even more uh, kind of challenging to get your head around it. But I'm now a very big advocate that remote, when you do it well, um, can actually be better 
better for client interaction, better for retention of talent, better for inclusivity, et cetera, et cetera. Wow, that's a, that's a bold statement. I'm definitely going to ask you about that, a bit more about that at the end. And um, Eloise, a little bit about you, please. Hi, well, um, thank you, Safan. Again, lovely introduction, and it's um, really great to be here with you. So thank you very much for asking me to be part of this. Um, okay, my background, so I've worked in a, a variety of different industries over the years. I ran my own business for over a decade, um, and basically now I work with other people building their businesses um, from a remote capacity, and that can be wearing the hat of a VA. So hopefully I'll be able to bring some of that kind of insight for the EAs who are becoming VAs or the VAs who want to kind of adjust to maybe managing more people working in that uh, capacity. So hopefully that'll be, I'll be able to add a little bit that way. Definitely, definitely. That's, I, I, think, um, I think it's very rare to have the opportunity to have a conversation with um, the VA and the, the exec together. Um, it's quite a treat, especially for me. Um, this is the first time I've had the opportunity of talking, well, apart from the little ones we've done before, but it's the first time I've had the opportunity of doing that. And um, I think it's going to be, I hope it's going to be really exciting for people to be able to see how a good relationship can, can work. So I think if we just go dive straight into the, the first, the first um, topic and around leading and, and, and motivating teams, um, remotely you obviously you mentioned that you think it can be better um but let's start first with the challenges like what do you think are the biggest challenges of leading a team remotely sure so so i would bucket them into i think there are four areas and i think all of them are a challenge unless you've thought about them carefully so i think the first is communication uh, how you have to change your communication uh to work with teams and understand the pressures that people are on because you can't physically look in their eyes or see where they are in the office the second is the tools and technology, I guess the infrastructure that you need to be able to do it well, uh, because a lot of companies weren't necessarily set up, I think, perfectly for remote when this happened. Uh, the third would be culture. Uh, so how do you actually create uh, a togetherness and engaging culture between the people that are working who are all in very different places with lots of other things to juggle during that day, whether it's childcare or elderly, elderly relatives or going for groceries when they know the stores are quiet. Uh, so it's, it's understanding that whole work-life integration piece. Uh, and then the last one I would say is visibility and workflow. So how do you actually know where things are and how they're getting done if you haven't got systems that are used to giving visibility about who's doing what and where things are in the process? And so what, and what, what have you, what, 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 what's been your experience of the, of the tech and the infrastructure that's worked really well that you've, that you've used during, like, to, to, to be successful? Yeah, so as I said, we're quite fortunate in that 12 years ago, the holding group that owns my company uh, pivoted to a virtual model. So we invested in building an architecture which was designed where everyone would be remote. So uh, we obviously use things like Zoom um, as a default. Uh, we always have video on. Um, so we make sure that everybody is there and present and we're very intentional about the communication uh, because otherwise I think people can hover into the background, have video off, and then they're not really present uh, in, a, in, a, in a conversation, which isn't like a meeting where people are obviously looking at each other and interacting. Uh, we have built our own wiki, like kind of wiki where all of the documentation for everything is stored. So anything you need to find is there. So an agenda for a meeting, the actions coming out of that meeting, the policies, everything, because of course, if you don't have people physically all in one place, people need to be able to find things quickly. Uh, and we also quite cleverly, uh, the RE team, as we call them, the employee in engagement team, actually encourage people to fill in certain kind of surveys on the wiki that tell people how they like to communicate. So what type of management do they like? How do they like to communicate? What excites them? What do they get uh, kind of annoyed about at work? Which signals to people actually how should I interact with this person when I haven't actually necessarily physically met them. Now we do come together at least twice a year as an entire company uh, and actually have like a week long uh, kind of quasi conference, upskilling, social thing that happens. But the rest of the time in between is all virtual. So I would say there are other tools like things like project management tools like Basecamp and Monday, which are very good for understanding where things are and who's doing what. Um, but it's a collection of different tools that you need for each of those four buckets. So you need some for communication, Zoom, Teams, WhatsApp's fine for certain things. But I think you do need to contract with people on how they like to communicate and how you're going to communicate. Because you are 
I guess, invading their home space, even though their home space is also now their workspace, yeah. you are, there is a danger that you step over a line because people are in a different space. So I think a lot of it is not just about their technology. It's about the, the setup, the contracting that people do individually and as teams together to go, let's talk about how we're going to do this, how we're going to work before we jump into it. And, and do you find that um, people are more accepting of certain platforms and certain tech channels for certain types of communication? Have you ever had to um, back on those sorts of things? Or? Yeah, I mean, there are different, definitely different types of people. There are some people that uh, are very comfortable and confident on video and jumping between email, WhatsApp, Microsoft Teams, maybe, uh, Zoom. And there are some that just really like physical interaction. Um, and therefore, I think you need to acclimatize the way that you lead um, and change things for different groups of people. Um, I, I think at this point in time, given this is all so new to so many people, to a some extent, you just need to do what a startup would do because we are in startup kind of iteration yeah. mode. You just need to go with what's working and then maybe stop to go, is this okay? Is this sustainable? If this is going to go on for a lot longer, or importantly, if this is going to be a way we work more in the future outside of this, that more people will work remote, remotely or expect to, then maybe we should look at changing this. But let's do what we can at this point in time. Let's not beat ourselves up for maybe not having first class enterprise software when we haven't had the time to get that up and running. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I heard I heard a story the other day of someone they're still they're still using um, a remote VPN, and I just thought to myself, of everyone trying to connect to that, must be an absolute tech nightmare. Yeah. Um, how have you found your leaderships improved from working remotely? Um, so I would say you you need to you need to adapt your style. Uh, a thing that's always been very important to me from leadership is emotional intelligence or EQ. Uh, which I think is over the last few years has become a lot more prevalent and talked about in leadership. But I think in a remote environment, it is super important because you need to read the signals. Uh, you need to actually look out for people that are a bit quiet because it's more difficult to actually sense that when you're not in an office walking around, when you don't see people in a meeting room around a table. So I think EQ is exceptionally important and communication needs to be a lot more intentional and more concise because when people are only receiving comms all day long, they're receiving WhatsApp messages, email updates from workflow tools, uh, documents coming at the Microsoft teams, all of these things, it, it, you've got to imagine that that's overload. So how does a leader think about the human emotional aspect of what is actually happening behind the screen when people are yeah. sat, I mean, I'm, as you can probably see, I'm in, I'm in a make, makeshift office where my, one of my daughters, my youngest daughter sleeps, her cot's just over there. Um, so in the morning, uh, I, I get up early and then I come up here and I work here for a bit. Then she needs to go to sleep, so I need to move somewhere else. And then my wife needs to go and do some stuff. So Jack and I will go and play for a little while and I'll turn the laptop off. And, and I've, I've, I've realised if that's happening for me, then it's the same for all of my team. So I kind of ask permission about when they want to interact or is it okay for us to talk about something rather than just stick a, a meeting in their diary because I think that's invading yeah. invading in a way that it doesn't suggest teamship to me yeah I got that that's I think it's um especially if 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 you've if you, you know I think there's been a lot of talk around learning who people really are you know seeing seeing them in their home environment you do get a sense of who they really are but it's also really hard to actually pick up on the on the nuances of when you are there physically. And Louise, for you, um, how do you sense if, um, if the people you're supporting are struggling or, um, uh, you know, how, how, if you can't see them, how do you how do, you do yeah. that? Or if you don't, if, you know, you don't have the chance to communicate. Yeah, I mean, you, you, need, you need to have a little bit more structure than you would when you're, when you're just in an office. Now, of course, most teams have, I guess, things like uh, personal development time to check in. But what you don't always have is dedicated one-to-one -one time with someone to check in. So there are, there's the, the normal throws of stuff that needs to get talked about, operational stuff. But I think you always need to make some time, whether it's at the end of a meeting or a separate session, which could be a quick call on Teams. Microsoft Teams is a great bit of tech for anybody that doesn't use it, by the way, because it's a great messaging platform. But it's also you can just hit video call and then you can see someone and chat to them. You can like people's comments, you can attach documents, you can send stuff to people. So it does a lot of the comms 
uh, kind of needs fairly well. Um, so the structure is quite important to, to make sure that you ask just saying, how are you getting on? Is there anything you're struggling with? Uh, can I do anything differently? Are you feeling overwhelmed? I think it's, it's the stuff that I think good leaders and managers are taught to do. It's just that you need to do it more often with more frequency and you need to make sure you fit it in because I know one of the challenges I had at the beginning with working for home is your head down and you're very action orientated. You're doing stuff and then like, I need something from someone and then you go, right, I'll call them, I'll WhatsApp them. And we all do that when we need to get stuff done, but appreciate that the other person on the other end of the phone is doing the same thing. And therefore you just have to, I think, nuance, um, nuance around that and make sure that you create structure and some space for people to be able to kind of work uh, effectively and Eloise what about you how do you how do you sort of sense if someone's struggling if you can't see them and if your bosses are struggling how do you um how do you sense that and what do you do around it I think a lot of it is going to sound like a cop out, but I think a lot of it's actually really similar. I think, I think as a VA, you have to think more as a, as a manager or a leader for your element in, in the business and what you're, you know, so you have to take responsibility for your part in, in whatever it is you're doing. So um, you need to be making sure that you take the time, like Paul says, to establish the best ways of communicating with the people you're working with, to consider um, re-evaluating those as you're working through. So I know a lot of people are going to be coming to this completely new. So it is like Paul says, take it on as if it's a startup. As if this is like day one and kind of have the chat of how people prefer to communicate. So for example, like Paul says, you might find your you've got somebody who's going to be working in a particular way, you're not always going to have visibility of that. So you need to be prepared that just because you need something from them, they're not going to necessarily instantly be available to you. So if you want to communicate something with that person, but it's not urgent, you might choose to use email formats. And then that person knows if you're dealing, if an email comes in, it's something that you need, but it's not crucial. It's just something to look at when they have time. Whereas you might want to use a WhatsApp platform or text or something like that, where you, if it's more urgent, you're going to contact them on that. So they know if they're getting, it, it automatically categorizes things for them without you having to kind of maybe invade their space with a call, which, you know, could be you're like really, really urgent. Um, but I think most, mostly it's just being really open to the communication, being prepared to revisit it. Um, and checking in as a VA, it's really important to say what's happening with you now, you know, how's your day, everything going okay. Just taking that time. Sometimes I think we forget that the people we work with or for um, are human beings and they're going to be having their own challenges and their own problems. So some checking in with them isn't, isn't overstepping a mark, particularly working virtually because you need that holistic view uh, and that visibility of their world to be able to manage what yeah. you're doing for them as effectively as possible in that in that week in that month um and if you don't do that then you can't help them be the best that they can be in that week and that might be considering things like people being unwell or childcare or needing to go to shops like Paul there's lots of things you're going to have to consider at the moment um and you need to have the com communication with that person to understand how their week's changed or the the new priorities today so I'd say comms more than anything it's comms and how build, did you... Build, oh, yeah, go on, Paul. Yeah. So I'm just going to say, building on Eloise's point, I found that something that I used... I started doing in a physical office environment, but I find it extremely valuable in a virtual or remote working, is check in at the beginning of the meeting. Just check how people are, how people are feeling, because people bring emotions and baggage to every environment to work anyway. So just get people... Loosen people up a bit by getting that out. And then at the end of the meeting check out and see how people are feeling. Is there anything people need support with? Um, is there anything people are concerned about? And then I think you can do that 90% of the conversation is about what do we need to get done? Uh, who's going to do what? Who's owning this, et cetera, which is obviously the, the ebb and flow of running a business. But if you, if you bookend it with the check-in and is everyone okay with this, then I think you give permission to people to speak out or to communicate with you ask afterwards and say they're struggling. Because I would imagine more people than ever are struggling with their workload and work-life integration than ever have before in the last few weeks. Can yeah, I add to that yeah. as well? Because like, um, obviously you, 
for you know like from the CEO point of view I think I would add is that it's important from a VA perspective to ask the questions and to encourage that visibility but I think something that you and I work really well with is that we've always worked very hard to have that transparency and that visibility and you are a really good example you are a really good example you, got brownie points how, and a, like, you are a really good example of how a CEO isn't I don't want to use like vul like people kind of hear the word vulnerability and think it's like about um, oversharing and I'm not saying we should overshare but I think authenticity and being prepared to give transparency and visibility of what's going on in your life as a CEO yeah. really is so important for your VA to understand to make sure that they can help you as well as they can. And, and Eloise, if you're not getting that from your exec and you're, you know, what, or, or let's say you've worked with them for a long time and the communication that you've had has been very transactional and now, and, and, and because you've been visible, because you've been in the office, but now you're not, how, how, how would you go about maybe retrospectively improving the communication? I don't think it's going to be like an instant change. Um, it's everyone's having to learn new skills and you're having to, really review methods that have been working for companies for decades and a lot of people will be seeing a shift from a tradi very traditional working method to a very new very virtual one and it it's going to take some people a little bit of time to adjust so I would say be patient be open don't give up if you feel that you are you know you may be tried to get that visibility or you approach that and you felt you were shot down initially don't take that as an instant no and that it's not worth the investment just appreciate that whilst you're working with people who are incredibly experienced and, and really great at what they do this is very much a transitional period for everybody yeah. and it can take people a bit of getting used to so be as open as you can, um, share your experiences, just explain that the reason that you want to do these things and have this method of communication or this transparency is because you want to be able to help and you need to have that in order to make sure that they are giving them the most efficient and beneficial okay. service you can. Um, I think we've got lots and lots and lots of questions to go through. Um, I might, I might leave a lot of them to sort of to the end, but one of the, around the, around the communication, just sort of to, to finish off the, the, the subject, um, are there any particular tools that you, um, you mentioned Teams, Paul, but for you, Eloise, are there any particular tools, you know, that, that would, would be really useful at considering now from a tech perspective, if you haven't, if you haven't implemented them already with your execs? I think a lot a lot is actually really I, I wish I had some like amazing like ethereal kind of concept but a lot of it's stuff that people will be using already which is actually the great thing about it um you're not necessarily having to introduce all new systems I mean obviously not everyone's going to be used to things like zoom which I think is really important to try and utilize something like that or skype or you know whatever works for your your team and your company um Teams is great. I think for me, it has its limitations. And certainly from a VA point of view, sometimes it can be overwhelming. You don't need all that information and it can actually consume you a bit too much from a time perspective. Um, I think personally, I utilize WhatsApp a lot um, because it allows me to use um, text. It, I can send screenshots. I, you know, it's, it's so versatile, but it's something they can pick up on their phone really easily. And you can leave a voice note, which I find sometimes it's, you know, the written word can just be so consuming, um, whereas a quick voice note is so much easier. So if you're not utilising that or you're with a company that are maybe would have been adverse to this point, try it. Definitely utilise yeah. it. Okay, great. That's great. Thank you. Um, so I think one of the one of the next things is um, one of the sort of the topics that we're looking at is working from home and the challenges of that personally and professionally. And I suppose for both of you, so maybe Eloise, if you want to go first, what for you are the, have been the best things about working from home and being a virtual assistant and what's been the hardest things? Okay. Um, so obviously, yeah, I mean, Paul and I are kind of, we're already, we were already kind of comfortable with this. So it's not as been an immediate shift for us, but obviously going back to when it was, the difference would be, um, I find that the work-life balance is, is better but it takes effort to make it better because actually i think it's a great risk of burnout which is a side note but i think it's important that people consider that too um if you're prepared to manage your day and your diary and all the rest of it i think it's a really efficient and really beneficial way of getting the balance between the two 
um, the lack of distraction and the ability to control kind of who um, enters your working space is really empowering and can really allow you to focus on what's, what the priorities are and where you want to be focused that day. Um, and obviously you're much more responsible for the space that you're in. So I think challenge wise, it's making sure that you don't feel the need to justify yourself and you don't find yourself stuck at your desk all day. So you do have to take responsibility for that. Uh, there's nobody's going to tell you to do that and um, no one will thank you if you do burn out so you need to get the balance right um, and then I guess as well it's knowing to, it's being able to separate it I think a lot of people are finding that they have because they haven't been working remotely it's having a space for that um, sitting in your living room might be super comfy but you're going to find it quite different to the feeling of switch off if you're always in your living spaces so it's trying to find a place that you can kind of make work and then make home um so i think those are probably the kind of key ones and setting the expectations of the people you work with because at the moment people are working longer if they're not going to travel but that doesn't mean that you need to necessarily be available to them 24 7 it's reminding people that you do have a life outside of that um, and you need to be clear on those time scales that you the people you're working with want you to work with them uh, that's not necessarily saying i won't be around but it's about understanding their needs and then maybe adapting so you might take time off in the middle of your day now if the people you're working with have more child commitments around different things and you might need to be available to them earlier or later but it's about adapting so that you're not going to be yeah. on the laptop all the time and, and what about for you paul i mean i would echo a, a, a lot of what eloise says around that 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 space and the balance i think when i first started doing it, i was probably working more hours because i'd start earlier and then I would end up finishing later because you don't have that natural place where it's like, okay, I need to leave to go and get a train to get out of London, to get home, to help put my kids to bed. You, 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 you kind of fit things in and then you carry on working. So I think it's very important that the culture of a business acknowledges that when a mass of people are working at home, there needs to be more flexibility. Our organization um, has created a culture where people are given the permission and the flexibility to fit in things during the day. And this was before COVID-19. So people can go to pick up their kids from school, drop them off. They can go grocery shopping or whatever, um, because it's, it's expected and understood that they will probably work a little bit later in order to deliver what they need to. And the focus becomes on contribution rather than presenteeism, uh, which I think is something that we could all uh, do well to recognize and think about. So, you, so, there's, there's positives in that I don't have to do my two and a half hour commute every day. So I get that time back. That's different, definitely given me some more valuable time with the family. But balancing family and work and video calls, sometimes quite late with the US and Asia, because I have a team in Asia, like talking to them, Singapore early time. It's, it, it's tough because there aren't that many spaces in the house. We were meant to move house to a bigger house and, our, and things are... Uh, things obviously stalled because of everything. So I would say they, they are the challenges from a personal and professional perspective. But if I, look at, if I look at it from a business perspective, one of the toughest things right now is obviously business development and selling is almost, it's not impossible, but it's very, very difficult. Um, and obviously that's the lifeline for a business. So we've spent a lot of time talking about, well, how do we make sure that we're sensitive to what's going on, but we are still moving our business along because all businesses need a pipeline for when this all disappears, right? Because otherwise yeah. uh, people may not have jobs, right? And there may not be enough liquidity in the businesses that, that people work in. So I think having conversations about those things uh, is, quite, is quite important. Um, and I would say that a lot, of, a lot of the things that we're talking about are very, very evidently needed right now. But the more, the more you get thrown into this, the more you realize that people actually adapt their own style uh, and they and humans are pretty good at adapting right i mean we've done it uh, when we're forced into different places uh, actually when there's restrictions and uh, that there's constraints on people it's actually when you often see the best innovation in people um, and that's been proven in history time after time um, so i actually think that another benefit is that innovation and thinking about how to do things differently and better can be done now because you haven't got as many meetings filling your diary or as many things that you may have done you haven't got the commute 
maybe you can do some more self-learning. You can listen to that podcast or jump onto an e-learning platform. There's so many great organizations that are giving free access to their learning content that was never there. Um, and you can also think about well, what can we do better? There's more people come online to buy in commerce in the last four weeks than probably the last four years, maybe the last 10 years. So we are going to go to a new normal where digital delivery, digital kind of delivery of anything, not just delivery of physical goods, but delivery of content, delivery of services uh, is going to be the norm. So businesses need to adapt to that and get ahead of it. Otherwise, they're going to find themselves come out of that. And the problem isn't about remote working, working from home. The problem is about, are we relevant anymore? Yeah. Uh, given the world and business has moved on so quickly. So I would encourage people to keep an eye looking forward on the mid to long term as well as the short term, because otherwise there's a danger that you lose sight of, well, what's our business going to look like in the end of 2020 and 2021? Yeah, the sort of reintegration thing is really interesting. And actually, Louise, like linking to that nicely, I was thinking, how has your day changed and how's the work that you do for Paul and the other CEOs you support changed over the last four weeks to the sort of to the period before? Okay. Um well, Paul is quite unique in that obviously he's remote he was remote from the off, whereas I worked I while I'm remote and have been for a long time, the pe- the companies that I work with, the people whose business I support aren't remote so Paul is unique so for them so I've seen kind of both I've seen um, pre-existing remotely based business and how that continues to work and then I've seen shift from um, sort of traditional office based um, to completely moving entire businesses to uh, people's bedrooms so um, in terms of the changes I guess it's what everyone's feeling right now which is uh, it's been trying to get hands you know, whether not every company has been lucky enough to have laptops for everybody, for example. So it's making sure everyone has the systems to work at home, uh, making sure that the networks are working, make, making sure everyone had access to things that they would have already had kind of up on their intranet, how those people have adapted to that. Um, so initially, the um, a lot of it's been, um, I guess, surviving. Um, I think that's been the main focus is helping businesses to just literally move, but move eff- effectively and not sort of like uh, not drop anything, not drop any plates, just to literally shift it. That's been the focus. Um, but now building on what Paul's saying, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a large advocate for this. It's not there is no there is no return to what we had before. We've got a new norm coming. So I'm helping businesses to to thrive and not just survive um, because it's about utilizing this time like Paul says whether that's CPD whether it's in terms of the structures or you know investment in your own people or the the term is pivot isn't it we've got furlough and pivoting they're the new dialogues but yeah whether the business needs to pivot um, and it's about helping businesses to utilize this time to do that because I think a lot of people are waiting to come out of the other side and like, oh, right, we'll just go back to the office now and it all go back to normal. And I think that's an, that, that will be an oversight. So I'm helping those businesses to make those adjustments. Um, and obviously having experience of working virtually, I've been able to help uh, them to adapt maybe a bit quicker to those sort of um, those situations. But it, it's certainly not something you would have to have a virtual experience in order to do. I think it's just being prepared from, from like the EAs who are moving to this capacity, you need to start thinking more holistically about how you can help the people you're working with to move the business in the right direction. And that again involves the communication with them to say, where are we going to focus? What can I help you in doing? You know, whether that's researching, whether that's just being more aware of things that are happening. Um, so I think there's a, there's a great deal we can be doing at this time. Yeah, I think so. And I think, um, the, the, you know, we, we've worked, I've worked with EAs for 15 years. And one of the key traits I see is emotional intelligence. And I think, you know, right now more than ever, it's so important for them to tap into that and use that to help the business maintain its culture and, and look where the gap could be in this new world and actually put themselves forward to, to take them on. But obviously, you know, it, it does take, you know, especially if you've been used to doing uh, let's say arranging meetings and travel consistently and right now there's none of that happening it's about slowly but surely building the great relationships with your executives so that you can start making the right and relevant suggestions and just to sort of finish on that point Eloise what what bit have you seen from Paul from supporting Paul like what tech and what system or what way of working have you seen 
from that business that you've tried to roll out to your other clients now and would you recommend for the people watching to have a look at? <laughs> Um, I'm going to sound question, like a, sorry. No, I'm going to sound like a, no actually no because I actually had a conversation with Paul about this recently saying by the way this is how you've really helped me working with you's really helped me so I'm actually ready for this but um it a lot of it I'm going to sound like a broken record but it's comms Paul is really good at his level of communication uh he's good at reckon he's very good with his people and um, skills so he's really good at understanding how people like to be communicated with he takes the time to just from one of the biggest things is everyone loves to be appreciated no matter what level you're at and Paul is very good at saying thank you for like little things even if we're in a whatsapp convo and I get like a little prayer hands emoji to something I've said that's been sorted it's just that constant feeling of recognition appreciation and that's fluid throughout the whole week so it's it's not like Paul's like oh it's nine o'clock let's say thank you to Eloise um we have like constant structure and it feels very natural and very organic but at the same time we do uh we have weekly catch-ups and we have uh, team catch-ups and we have team whatsapps so it's not just talking about work uh, which I think is really important and like you say from an emotional perspective building that team is really good so um, more than anything it's just making sure that the communications that people as managers um, whatever level that is that you're taking the time to build those relationships and effective communication because it is a different style of communication now than when you were in the office so you need to make that time and invest in yourself as well if you don't feel like that's your natural thing like Paul says use this time look at CPD look at you know TED talks look at things that might be able to help you to be better at working with your team but also those things like um, uh, personality quizzes um, or you know like that can help you understand the different personalities within the team that you work with um, and those you can get those for free and they can just help you understand how those people approach things how they deal with things and that can help you better gear how you deal with them and likewise for an EA it's just as important that you do that with the people you work with now because you won't have the benefit of physical you won't always be able to see their mannerisms you won't have those attributes so you need to try and get a deeper level of understanding to try and make your communication as beneficial and and succinct as possible how did you do so if you don't mind me asking um how have you managed to build a strong relationship without ever meeting I and mean, we've got people that have started jobs and been onboarded completely virtually now and that's totally new for them you know they could have worked as an ea or or in a business for 25 you know for 25 30 years and then they're now being thrown into, you know, trying to work out who the people they're supporting are without actually meeting them. Um, how have you guys done that? So, when, when, when I uh, actually it was it was my wonderful wife that actually found the business that um, that the intermediary that um, I found Air Louise through. It's actually a business called Time Etc. Um, that manages creates virtual assistants and. Um, or kind of helps businesses find them. And so I hadn't even thought about it at that stage. Um, and so Eloise and I jumped on a Zoom call, I think was the first thing we did and started to just have a chat. And it was a chemistry meeting, right? It was just, do we get on? How do you work? What's important to you? Because I think that chemistry is, is super important. Um, and then it was Eloise's suggestion, actually, as she just said, to, to do a personality test uh, once we decided to work together so we could understand the type of individuals we were. And I think that's so important, like profiling um, and understanding people's strengths, because everybody has a slightly different um, profile. Some people uh, are, ve are very dominant. And there's lots of different tools. There's uh, Myers-Briggs, Thomas International, um, Eloise, what's the one we did, the online one? I think it's like personality. What, I want to say it's like 360. I think personality so. 360. I that's an easy cheat a, lot of, a lot of people are very sceptical about these, aren't they? They, don't, they think they're a load of nonsense. Um, I, I mean, I don't agree. I think they're great, but... It's the time to try everything. So even Absolutely. if you've been cynical before, if this is going to be what brings your business through this, then I would say embrace it. I think now is not the time to decide not to try something you might find is absolutely fundamental to your business surviving. Um, yeah. and it's and really I, also think, to do. I also think it may not be 100% accurate, right? But yeah. most of these things indicatively have some truth to them. And you'll know... If you find the insight and then try something and it works, you'll know, right? It gives you some, it gives you some inspiration for how to connect or communicate or do things differently with a person, because 
some people, let's face it, some people hate being told what to do. I'm not particularly good at doing, being told what to do, which is why I ended up trying to get into leadership. So I didn't have to be told. Um, but likewise, some people like a lot of time to stew on thing and actually think about it. Whereas some people are creative people, some people are completer finishers. If you don't have any sense of that, then you're going to misfire quite a lot of the time. And in a virtual environment, as I think we've already demonstrated, that becomes actually quite unproductive and can become quite harmful for the people you're working for. So the, these, these things, they may not be perfect, but I've, I've done every different profiling. Some are better than others, but I've always found there's a kernel of truth in it. And if you mm. do profiling and 360 feedback, and 360 feedback doesn't need to be this glorified tool or platform, it's just tell me what you think I'm doing well, feel free to transparently send it to me at any point, what you liked about what I did well in that meeting or what I could have done better, because everybody gets better in that environment. And I would actually argue that it's maybe a bit easier for the person, for both ends, for people to receive feedback and to give it in a virtual environment because you're not sat in front of that person. Yeah. It's actually the most uncomfortable bit for all of us, right? Even if you're a leader yeah. and you're telling someone that they are not delivering, no one enjoys doing that. No. Right? Only a very small amount of... Small people do, a small number. Yeah. Some, you know, <laughs> I did read a book that told me that actually uh, there are the, the, the traits of a CEO, a successful CEO and a psychopath are extremely similar. Oh, um, God. Only difference is empathy. The only the only oh. thing that separates them is the height, the quality, mm, the, the yeah. degree of emotional intelligence and empathy. Um, yeah. so I'm not saying I'm a psychopath, but um, <laughs> no comment. Oh, no comment. Um, and um, sort of just last last sort of tip around personal and professional life is just covering childcare because this is something that's been really new to me. And um, you know we've got two small children and. Uh, trying to trying to balance that you've obviously been working from home for a while you've got two small children how have you managed that and have you got any tips on how to um you know I spoke to my 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 um to one of us the other day and he'd locked himself in the garage that was the only where the only place he could get any space from the kids without constantly interrupting but I I did hear one one company um have sort of made a, a blanket rule where you're not allowed to apologize if your kid runs into a zoom yeah. um but i wondered if your company uh, and you had any other tips to offer or any yeah, personal we, experiences to share our company is very good at that we encourage that so the week before last we actually were due to have a leadership offsite in the us so we were all physically meant to be together uh rather than can it we decided instead of it being a three-day meeting we would have like two hour bursts over three days uh, and we came together and at one point um, my wife had to do a call um, and the kids were neither of the kids were well actually my eldest doesn't sleep during the day my youngest 18 month old still has a sleep she wasn't uh, she wasn't asleep so both of them were there and I managed to keep them quiet in front of the telly with popcorn for a little while and then an hour and a half into it Jax comes over and starts talking to me and I'm like I, don't, I just need I just need to go with this I put him on my lap my boss did the right thing, which was he gave permission. He started actually shooting cobwebs at Jack um, and gave everybody in the room the permission to put down the focus on the leadership meeting and to just interact with him. So I think a lot of it is just being human, right? We're all really bad in business about putting this face on, this game face or this business kind of way of operating. To me, the thing I've learned most about being a leader is that if you are one person at work and another person at home, then that is going to, at some point, that friction is going to really kind of create mental health or challenges for you. So if you, if you can actually find the balance between those at this time, then I think you'll be better going back into the workplace. Um, generally speaking, I think you just have to trial and error different things so um i'll get up earlier uh, i will then uh, say to my wife why don't you go and shower and everything i'll look after the kids i'll drop off eloise knows that so she doesn't communicate to me at that time or if she does she'll just send me something like an email or a message a voice message for me to pick up um and then when i have a late call i saw someone asked about managing time zones um when i have a late call like a 7 30 8 30 call I will disconnect at five and I will go and take the kids for a walk outside, given that's the only thing we're allowed to do right now. Uh, or on a normal day, I will just go and play with them for a while. Just tell Eloise I'm offline for a little while. I'll go offline on Teams uh, and you can set it and say I'm offline um, and tell people that I'm not there. 
I'll go and do that and then I'll come back on and I'll turn on for a couple of hours a bit later on. Um, so I don't think that, I don't think there's any magic formula to no. managing childcare at this point. I think it's, it, it's maybe having conversations with the people you work for to explain how you're trying to manage this. I think you need to signal where some of the challenges are for those people that aren't that emotionally intelligent so they can pick it up and maybe think maybe I need to do something differently. Um, yeah. and then, don't beat yourself up I think is my bit my best piece of advice because I think we're all enjoying if we've got children having a bit more time with them but at the same time they're probably driving us crazy because you don't want them in front of the screen the whole time and I feel a bit guilty about being a parent at the moment like the only way sometimes is to put head down is to put another another episode of uh Ben and Holly's or or another episode of uh of uh Peppa Pig but I think we just have to go with it. Um, and But then when you are with them, probably think about how can I do things that are more focused on creativity and that just actually craft. El- and Eloise is fantastic on this level. She I was just going to say. She sends yeah. me examples of things to do, like TED Talks or resources that she found because a few people in our team are parents. So she generously gives, even though she doesn't have children, she knows it's an issue for us. So she sends in our group team chat. I just saw this thing on, te- on, on TED with 10 ways to stimulate creativity in your kids or these courses for Open University are now free or whatever it might be. And it's the, it's the care, generosity and the, the, and, and the time taken that I think makes the difference there. Yeah, and I was actually just going to say, as an, as an EA slash now VA, you, you, you know, whereas before maybe you didn't get involved in your boss's personal lives, actually now they kind of, for them, there isn't really a separation. So anything you can do, I guess, right now to help them is only going to be beneficial. So whether it's sending suggestions of things that they can do for kids, but is there anything else that you would recommend that the EAs could now, that VAs could now do for their bosses and to help them with their personal lives? I think. Very much like what what Paul's, I mean, Paul's given a a good example there of like things that they can be doing. But I think the the key thing is that if you're going from a traditional business mindset of being, you know, an EA, which has been very much office based and you've been, understandably, your focus has maybe been on your travel, meetings, accommodation, diary, calendar, because you might have somebody who's traveling like three weeks out of four and it's literally all encompassing. And now it's not any of that for understandable reasons. It's about recognizing, it doesn't mean that your, your job is like stopped. It just meant that that was the previous way that you were responsible for giving like making things as as well as good as possible for your boss your whoever you're working with to be the best version of themselves and what they're doing and it's now just that their focus has changed so now you're now the person you're working for you just need to think how can I help this person make the most of their week in the current climate and be the best version of themselves and that means you have to look holistically now so things like childcare. Um, health um, in terms of it could be if you know somebody's not feeling well in the family if there's anything you can do about that make sure you bring out your human side and it is about emotional like considering like can I help with anything can I look for anything is there anything I can do here are some examples of stuff you could do with the kids here's a competition here's something that you might want to consider Um, this is something that's free and also saying, asking the questions, what are you, are you going to take any time today? You know, I thought maybe we could block this out so you could do something with over lunch with the kids or do you want to do something tonight or actually your diary's not that busy there. Shall we just leave that whole afternoon out? But it's about not waiting to be asked. Now is the time to empower yourself within your role to be, to make sure that the, the people you work with understand your new possibility and your new potential in this climate. So be available to them, but come with options and solutions to problems that they may not realize they've had yet, but try and foresee them. Yeah, that's really good advice. Thank you. It's all about the right mindset. Um, great. Well, we've got lots of questions. I'm going to try and pick some of the best ones. So just give me a, give me a second. Um, sure. So, uh, do, do, do. Um, how do you, Eloise, how do you keep all of your different execs' information organised? Uh, wow, okay, organised. Um, I guess if it, it organised is, for me, is like quite structural, whereas I'm thinking, if you mean how do I balance it all, again, for me then it's expectation setting. It's about understanding their needs and the times that they're looking to work and then communicating what I'm, how I can then fit with that. 
Um, so again, it comes back down to communicating. So if, if you're lucky enough to work with one person, it's about understanding how the new, uh, the new situation is going to mean they want to work and then making sure that you're working accordingly. If you, however, have children yourself and you're like, that's not going to really work or don't just come back and say that's not going to work for me. Come back with ways that you could work around it. And sometimes that might be like finding a buddy within your company. If there's a couple of EAs that you know that you're, you know, work in your business, maybe you can buddy up. So actually, while you're going to be working with your your boss or your client, um, somebody can maybe be helping to kind of en entertain children wise. You can have like a Zoom. You could be doing something that might do some homeschooling. Utilize your network. Don't just feel you have to do everything by yourself. So think again, think bigger picture. And if there's what find ways to get around these really sm what are relatively small inconveniences to help you better manage not just the person's day that you're working with, but yours as well. Make sure you're not inconveniencing yourself. Because like Paul said, it's if you get that friction, it's only going to be a short period of time until it becomes a problem. Yeah, that's yeah. And, and that links quite nicely. I've, I've, there's another question around personal boundaries and work boundaries. I know um, people are working. Uh, they're more productive, but they're working longer. Um, so just need some guidance, some more guidance, if possible, on just separating business and personal life. So I saw that question as well. Um, I think if you're starting early and working late, then you have permission to be able to take some time off during the day. Um, and I think you have to actually put that in your calendar if you're not doing it. Um, I think you either get into the routine yourself and you're comfortable and you stop and you go and do something or you make sure you take some time out but if not i would actually physically put in the calendar like in the normal world uh, eloise here's a good example eloise and i regularly would talk about um i'm just not getting to the gym i i, I was meant to go today and i didn't because i started early and i missed my drop kids at nursery go to gym and then come home um and so eloise just said well i'll just put it in your diary and it was like such a simple thing uh, and i don't necessarily do it 100 percent of the time but where it's there it prompts me and reminds me and it's just little things like that for because i think once something's in your diary psychologically tough, I need to do that i'm committed to that i must yeah. do that uh whether that's go for a walk or take some time out or shut the laptop down i think we sh we can use like just messages notifications to ourselves in our own diaries to remind ourselves to do things like that yeah great um, gosh, there's so many good questions. I don't know how I'm going to pick them all. Um, so as a team, we've diarised some coffee time to have one-to-ones just to check in and have human catch-ups with one another. Do you have something like this or is there any ad advice on any ideas that could be similar to this? To how to, uh, you know, as a team to build that social element, you know? I assume they're vir that's virtual. Virtual, yeah. Virtual, yeah. yeah. Well, we do that. We, yeah. we, we do those. Um, so whether it's a coffee or whether, you know, whether you're just having a brief catch up, but like I say, if it's, if it's, I would, I know I sound like I'm getting some sort of like um, dividend from Zoom here, but I really would push Zoom as a really good um, tool to bring people together visually because we are lacking that. And it does help you to rem remember to keep connecting and, and remind you of the attributes of those people when you're seeing them. And you can, have, you can have a much more personal conversation. So do try and make the time to do that. But at the same time, I would say, and it comes back to the previous point, if you've put half an hour in for a Zoom, please stick to half an hour. If you start running over because you actually didn't have anything, be considerate of other people's timescales. So that's another thing to be important because otherwise you're going to find less people are going to want to join or, you know, to be, be stick with what you've organized. Um, yeah. And if you, you know, and then it's not going to inconvenience anybody, but at the same time, I think, when you're looking at connecting, use things like a WhatsApp group, because we have one of those as well. Uh, Paul and I will chat, at, you know, I say chat, we will catch up when things are more urgent on WhatsApp, but there's also a team chat, which is sometimes related, you know, like for business, but sometimes it's like, like I say, where I'll share things where I'm like, oh, parents, this is something to think about, or, well, you know, it's something like where Paul will share something to say, this member of our team did this amazing thing, check this out, guys. And it's a place where we can all then celebrate that. And yeah. it, removes, it pulls everybody together. So try and maybe Not, set something like that. And like in Teams, actually, we have the, the, the overall company has actually created channels that are just simply about share stuff to mm. do with your kids during COVID-19 or who's got a great new app for managing meditation and mental health. Like there are specific places for that rather than just the business chat. And I think 
like when we're talking about work and life integration, that, that, that should happen anyway. But I think this period hopefully will allow it to be a little bit more comfortable for people to do that. And as, as Eloise said, things like Zoom and WhatsApp, just simple tools that everyone can get for free have got lots of fun elements to them. So we do on a Friday, we just get the team together and we all put a virtual background on. So like a background like that. Um, where I'm like, oh, now I'm on holiday, uh, or I fancy going to uh, Tuscany, <laughs> or I'm in, or I'm in Ibiza, um, and it, it, it like Very takes, good that, though, takes five minutes to to set it up. Um, but it, I mean, we do it actually do our our chat on a Friday in a virtual pub, so everyone picks one of their favourite pubs as a background, uh, nice. and then we don't talk about work; we just chat. We actually use the share screen thing to share a stupid video that someone's found this week. Uh, and some of the guys will talk about what the parents will talk about what they're doing with their kids. So in the same vein as the one-to-one, just think about some fun, fun time and how you like take work off the table and maybe people will, like, we've actually got a theme now. So last week's was pirates. One of the guys <laughs> turned up, like his kid actually dressed him up with makeup and everything and a pirate hat on. I, I don't know what the theme is this way it, it just different. makes it a little bit interesting engaging so obviously it's, there's nothing quite the same as being in a pub having a drink with someone or having a coffee with someone but there are many things that you can do creatively through video i'm sure we're all connecting with relatives or friends that we haven't spoken to for years yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm playing board games with our neighbors via zoom there, there's so much you can do just be a bit creative yeah. and take license with it yeah and definitely yeah but i heard that can work, can yeah, can work. Like I, I know we, when we have those catch ups and we have that weekly thing, if you're having a coffee or you're having the virtual drinks, ban work, no work combo. Like it's literally just about you yourselves because if you allow it to come in at least even a little bit, then you're suddenly losing the essence of the, the reason you guys got together in the first place. Great. And last thing before we all, um, before we all sign off, um, how do you think this is gonna impact the future way of working? Uh, there's a few questions I saw about that, the, like the new world order. It, it yeah. undoubtedly will change it. I mean, there are already a lot of dynamics within future of work that were driving this. 50% of the workforce will be millennial, whatever that means, 18 to 34, whatever it is, uh, by 2022. And their expectations about how they work flexibly, the number of jobs they have in their lifetime, uh, how they develop more quickly are totally different to uh, my generation, the generation before anyway. Um, and I think, as I saw a couple of people mention, when people have had the opportunity to work from home and they've acclimatised to it, they're not going to, I think a lot of people aren't going to want to go back to four five days, days in the office or five days in the office. Yeah. Um, now that's going to be a challenge for some people, but any leaders on the call, I would really encourage you to think about if the expectations of a group that is critically important to you have changed, whether that's your customers or your talent, your employees, then you need to think long and hard about how to serve those, those stakeholders differently because otherwise there's a danger that they might see a, something better somewhere else. And that's as true for a, 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 like a business like yours, Sivan, that is adapting because there's not as much to do in the normal world as yeah. they're adapting to provide value like this, right? The businesses yeah. that are just carrying on sitting there, not changing, and expect their employees in four months' time or whatever it is to just turn back up on a, on a, a, a through their commute and be in the office for five days. I think they're, 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 they'll, they'll, they will find that they will lose talent very quickly if they do that. Yeah. Because I think forward-thinking companies will use this as a chance to springboard. But I, I get it. You know, it, it is hard if your if your environment has been quite traditional. It's hard to even think about how can we how can we go back to or offer some offer a part of this continually. But it's definitely yeah. something that it doesn't need to be whole hog thinking. straight away. But no, of course a, a not. A phased plan for how you move more towards flexibility, yeah. work-life integration. I don't think any company on the planet can't start that journey. No, and I think that they will all be. Happy. Is there anything that, that the VA could start doing? Do you think to help their execs think about that? Um, I mean, yes. I mean, but again, it's in terms of the conversations you have with the with the execs that you're working with. Um, in terms of your role now, like I say, a lot of VAs might be struggling with the move from traditional to the virtual one. But part of helping your company, your business 
look at that as a whole is understanding how you would now fit into that so it's about recognizing where you can be valuable and how you're going to be valuable so the more that you can bring that to the attention of the people you work with and can be looking at how actually working virtually can be really beneficial to the relationship you have then i think that's really going to help your execs looking at how they can then maybe build that in going forward because like paul says i think yeah. I think long term, it's not going to, it's going to be very difficult to just step back into the office because even if your clients might not be ready and waiting either, but the amount of money that the businesses are going to invest in the new structures to work virtually and continue to run their businesses, it's going to be a huge investment. So you're not going to just want to throw that away. So it's about no. helping the execs that you work with to understand how actually a virtual investment can actually be a beneficial move for the business. So think about it holistically and the value you can add now in a different way. Amazing, absolutely amazing guys. Thank you so, so much. Um, uh, you know, thanks everyone for coming. Thank you guys for giving up your time and for, for willing to do this. Um, it's really, really helpful. It's been so nice chatting to you both. Um, I, know you, I know Eloise, you're happy to help anyone who, who has yeah. any questions. Um, so um, we'll be sharing everyone's contact we're going to have a break next week um for easter we're going to be back on the 22nd um and we're we're super excited about the next two webinars um we've got two absolutely genuine superstars lined up as well um on the 22nd we've got um vicky sokal evan who has a company called red cape and she is the most tech savvy person in the world i've ever met um my jaw was dropping when i was having training with her um, uh, on, on, I didn't realize how completely incompetent I was at Office 365. So she's going to be giving loads of tips. She's a Microsoft whiz. Um, and, um, uh, and then afterwards, we've got the wonderful Bonnie Lowe Kramer. If you don't know her on the 29th, absolutely brilliant. And she is the ultimate assistant. She spent her, spent her time training people on, on that. She's got a, written her own book. Um, and she's going to be talking about um uh well we're not 100 percent sure yet so i'm going to give toes away but but she's talking on the 29th and um actually speaking of the two of them they've got a really great webinar lined up tomorrow um which we're going to share the link with you guys as well um uh, they've got their own webinar which um is, is going to have conversation as well and a, a really special surprise guest so i highly recommend tuning into that we're going to share that on our linkedin but also in the follow-up so Thanks so much, everyone, for supporting these, and we will see you on the 22nd. Happy Easter. I look forward Thank to eating you. Everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Take everyone. Care. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye. Goodbye, everyone.